Hi folks, coolant and cutting fluids. Coolant plays a really important role in the way we machine our parts. And I wanna start this series talking about how we take advantages of its benefits, things like flushing out chips, process reliability, service finishes and tool life, but equally as important, let's talk about how we avoid the negatives, the bad outcomes, the bad situations around coolant, which is a great segue to talking about water in today's video. Take a look at this. In the left glass, we have what I'm calling pure water. We'll come back to what pure water really means. And watch it, what happens as we apply a pure soap to it. The water on the right was tap water, which here in central Ohio is quote unquote hard. So we can see that these react very differently. And while soap is different than a CNC machine coolant, this logic holds true. And it's the one thing I want everyone to take away from this video is not all water is equal. We need to know what we have in our shop and we need to know what to use and when. Another way of showing the difference between purified water and, and hard water is in this example with coolant. In the hard water container, the minerals ultimately start interfering with the dispersion of the oils and they create larger particles, large enough that it actually affects how the light bounces off the coolant. That's why it looks milky. The exact same coolant in purified water doesn't have that problem. You can see it looks clearer. This is the same coolant in the same concentration after only a few hours. You can see what a difference that is. Imagine how you would think as a machinist if your tool holders or your cutting tools were this affected by a variable. You would take it really seriously. You might have heard the recommendation, I know we had, that you're supposed to use tap water for your initial sump fill and then subsequent top offs should be done with purified water. Why is that? We lose coolant from our machines in two forms. Number one is runoff, coolant that literally leaves the machine either with our workpiece or with our chips. The second is evaporation. The coolant is not what it's evaporating, it's just the water. The reason you're not supposed to continue topping off with tap water or hard water is that that's going to cause you to continue adding more minerals to your sump over time. But again, why? Why are we not supposed to use minerals as we top off, but we are supposed to when we start. Well, let's rewind a little bit. The reason we don't always wanna use perfectly pure water in all situations is that some amount of hardness can actually help our coolant, especially when it comes to preventing foaming, especially as machine tools have gotten higher RPM spindles. We've all seen that when you have a coolant line hitting a face mill at 10,000 RPMs, as well as with through spindle coolant systems that are generating the higher pressures like 70 bar or 1,000 PSI. We don't want foaming. Minerals tend to help with that. If you've never had a problem with foaming and you're using purified water like DI or RO, you could probably actually continue using straight purified DI or RO water. If you do have problems with foaming, number one, talk to your coolant rep, but having some presence of minerals can help either pop those bubbles before they really start to foam or prevent them from forming in the first place. However, our coolant's going to last longer the fewer the minerals that we have because those minerals are going to interact with, they have their own positive or negative charges. They're going to interact with or potentially even interrupt the emulsifier's job. We actually saw that here at our shop a while back. We didn't do a good enough job monitoring our input water quality. The emulsifiers lost their effectiveness and it literally caused the droplet sizes of our coolant cutting fluid to increase in size. And we actually saw kind of drops on the ceiling of our machining center. And that's part of what triggered this whole process of let's really learn and figure out how we do this better. Talk to your coolant rep about this. Coolants have different ability to built in to handle different types of water and hardness. But the two things that are important is number one, know what water you have and how you're going to create that water and sustain it in that condition. And then number two, figure out, does your coolant like that kind of water? Or if not, what sort of coolant should you use? It's actually been kind of fun to learn about this. There are places in the US or even in the world where they just know they're going to have hard water. So you can build a coolant that is able to handle that much better. However, you're still going to pay the price of a shorter coolant light. In those places, you may only get, say, six months of sump life, whereas if you're using good water and you're maintaining it, you should be able to get one to two years of sump life out of coolant. So the tools that we recommend you have, number one, you've got to have a refractometer. We use both the analog and the digital. The digital one's actually really nice uh, and not that expensive. It makes it really handy to check this. But the number one mistake that we see is that folks don't calibrate them. 
you need to calibrate a refractometer based on the source water that you're using for that machine. On the analog refractometers, you'll apply your source water on, use a screwdriver to adjust the screw so that your baseline reading is zero. Buy a TDS meter, stands for Total Dissolved Solids. Very inexpensive and an easy way to see do you have hard water at your tap or if you're buying or sourcing water, what condition is it in? We also put a inline TDS meter on our system, which shows us what's flowing through, which makes it a really easy way to make sure we don't have a problem in our system and aren't accidentally generating bad water. And lastly, pick up some pull strips. Card here to the NYC CNC page where we've got all of our processes and tools laid out. But pull strips are a nice analog and pretty easy and cheap way to check these readings. And it can really help uh, when you make that first phone call to your coolant rep to sort of say, hey, here's the problem or here's our situation. You're armed with that information on things like pH, alkalinity, et cetera. The coolant reps that we've worked with have always been willing to test our water for us as well, usually at no charge. So definitely take advantage of that. But if you're running a shop, you absolutely need to have some of the basic tools in-house. So we know how to test our water. We know it's important. How do you source it? So if you're a small shop, only a few machines, uh, RO water is usually the way folks go. It's what we do with a caveat though. RO membranes are really expensive. They wear out and RO doesn't make your water perfect. It just improves it. So the condition that that water starts in drastically affects how good the RO output water is and how long your membrane lasts. So we had to add a water softener, which massively increases the lifespan of the otherwise expensive uh, RO membranes. But also the frustration if you have an RO membrane go bad is you start making bad water, you may not even realize it. So our recommendation on a DIY system is softener into a RO system along with a DI canister. Luckily, that's all still fairly inexpensive. You can also buy RO water, however, check it. We have heard stories of folks that have bought RO water, you know, the five gallon buckets at your grocery store. It's actually not that good. Luckily, and we'll talk about this in the next video on coolants, semi-synthetic coolants like we use Qualicam 251C aren't that sensitive to having some uh, TDS or hardness in the water or minerals, but don't assume because you're buying RO water that it's perfect. If you're a bigger shop, get a DI system. This is a vendor service contract. Depending on how many machines you have or how much water, probably somewhere between $80 and $200 a month. They actually bring in a couple of tanks, they monitor it, they swap the tanks out so you're never down. Uh, the benefit is you can use the pressurization of your local water source as it's pushed through the DI canisters, which lets you use things like the Venturi style adjustment knobs that are really handy to mixing coolant. It's a pretty good solution. It's what we see on most of our factory tours at larger shops. We'll wrap up with the mistakes that we see. Number one mistake we see, I already mentioned, folks using refractometers but not calibrating them. Number two mistake, not realizing if your coolant is a good coolant for your shop or your water. There are some coolants out there that are incredibly sensitive to having really pure water. And if you don't know that and you ever introduce water that has hardness or other characteristics to it, it can be really bad. And we often see folks blame the coolant and the reality is it probably was more to do with the water or just not understanding the operating conditions that that coolant was meant to work in. Number three, not having a sustainable system. Whether it's a DIY for RO system or whether it's a commercial deionization system, make sure it's sustainable over time. Our system wasn't sustainable because we didn't realize how quickly we were blowing through RO membranes at first. What's scary on a deionization system is that once you exceed the capacity of the resin to continue to do their job, they actually start discharging effectively salt water back into your water system so that they can try to absorb more calcium and magnesium. So you're actually outputting far worse water than if, than if you weren't even using a system. So whatever you do, you've got to have the checks and balances in place to make sure that it works over time. And on that note, the last mistake we see is folks not having a maintenance schedule. Pick whatever works for you. I would really encourage you to check your bricks at least every day. And we'll go into more detail on things like machine maintenance and sump maintenance in one of the next videos. Let us know in the comments below what else you wanna hear and learn about whether it's water or coolant or maintenance, et cetera. Otherwise folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.